of things, but I watched you all on live stream, and I got to tell you, you look marvelous. You, you should all get your own YouTube channels and just you know, broadcast 24-7. But I did come back for the reception. I heard there was going to be beer, and, uh, and, and that was unbelievably valuable. I mean, you, you all just didn't turn it off. And um, I, mean, I talked to Brian Rutledge with the National Audubon uh, Society, and he was connecting the dots for me between some critical invasive species issues and avian mortality. And I talked to Pat Cummings from Esri, and, and who feels, you know, whatever the challenge, whatever the, the interrelationship of challenges, we can map that. We can, we can better visualize it. Um, uh, Jeff Whitney, the state forester from Arizona, importing some historical context into these conversations. Uh, Ed Arnett with uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, um, who's been a, really a, a, a participated in nearly all of our initiatives. Well, he just pretty much talks about hunting, but still, um, the, the, it was clear to me that we've assembled exactly the right people for this conversation, and I am so appreciative. I'm so excited to see the outcomes of this forum, and on behalf of the Western Governors, it's, uh, I'm honored to thank you for your uh, participation. I'm looking forward to day two, and I'll turn it over to John to get us started. guys need time at all? You're good. So the panelists want to amble on up here while I say a couple of things. Jim just started it early, I realize, so that's good probably in a way. Um, they told me that what we had two, over 200 people watching the stream, guys, yesterday at least, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm having some people, I have a big USGS grant that does GIS and I told them they, the technology one ought to be one they watch for sure because there's a lot of neat stuff coming for that. So everything will be run just like yesterday in terms of, um, well, except for the tech panel, they have a little more time to present because of the nature of what they've got to present. But people have been asked to do about five minutes or so of, of key points that they, they want to mention introduce their topic and so forth, and then as, as before, we'll um, ask these folks to, to think about and answer some questions about the topic, and then if there's time, turn it over to you guys to ask other questions. So with that, let me introduce the first panel. The topic of it is balancing multiple policy objectives with cross-boundary management. So people, again, with a lot of experience in this area, First will be Tim Griffiths, the Western Regional Coordinator, Working Lands for Wildlife, NRCS. Then someone I, I've had the privilege to work with a lot over the years, Dustin Miller, who's the Administrator of the Idaho Governor's Office of Species Conservation, followed by Tyson Bertone Riggs, the Program Manager, Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. Then Brian Keith, the Senior Policy Advisor in, for Lands of the Nature Conservancy. And finally, Doug Wheeler, partner of Hogan Lavelle's. So, Tim, why don't you start us off? Okay, perfect. Hey, good morning. Well, first off, I got to tell you. Uh, I don't know who from Colorado is going to buy me lunch, or maybe it'll be a, a, an arm wrestling tournament to figure it out, but uh, I noticed yesterday when I arrived, you guys were really, really dry, and I called my wife, and she said it snowed another eight inches yesterday, and I you know, made a few calls, brought a little storm your way uh, last night, so I thought we'd share some of the, some of the love with the precepts. So. Um, no, and... and, and I'm Tim Griffith with NRCS, and NR the Natural Resource Conservation Service is a, is a funky little federal agency that doesn't fit the typical mold, right? We're a, we're, we don't necessarily have a mandate and a law that, you know, we have to go enforce and regulate. We're, we're really an agency that, that solely works with people that want to work with us, and we primarily focus with, you know, farmers, with ranchers and, and private uh, timber owners to voluntarily look at their operation and help them address you know, issues that are impacting their operation, 
um, is, is in, in, in develop win-win solutions that um, not only solve their problems, but solve some problems associated with the larger landscape. And we're, we're, we're fortunate to be blessed with uh, significant resources through the Farm Bill that we could also uh, steward and, and partner with these ranches and farms and timber owners to, to really help accelerate the implementation of beneficial conservation practices and, and, and get to some of these scale concepts where, where we get outcomes that matter. So what I'm gonna share with you today is a little bit of an example of what we call our working lands for wildlife. It's not a government program. Okay? It, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's what we consider our premier approach for strategically implementing our existing programs to maximize benefits for both people and wildlife. It's really that simple. So we're gonna walk through one example here throughout the West where we're focusing on addressing, you know, woody invasion across uh, the Western grazing lands through, through things like Western juniper trees, uh, all the way into uh, uh, Utah juniper, further east, we get into Eastern red cedar hunting mesquite. It doesn't really matter the species, the phenomenon's really the same, where we've taken a lot of uh, liberty in, in preventing a lot of fires and a lot of, you know, uh, succession has really taken over and picture like you see on the screen is very common across the entire West. And what we know about a phenomenon like this, when these trees come into these arid landscapes, they, they're like a thousand little straws sucking up what limited moisture is available and they, 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 they make a lot of impact. And one of the fascinating things is its impacts on water. A study in ARS showed that, you know, when trees are, enter into a treeless landscape, they really screw up the dynamics associated with wind. And instead of moving that snow into these snow drifts and having these frozen reservoirs that slowly release water on our ranches throughout the growing season, they end up evenly distributing it and letting a lot of that moisture leave through the atmosphere and with, without much benefit. Um, we also know that we have tremendous impacts in our livestock. When these you know, trees come in, they outcompete that grass and that forb and the, and the forage base uh, so much that we're losing, you know, in a, in, a, in a very short period of time, up to three quarters of the entire available forage that we need to feed livestock. Um, but maybe that's not your deal. Maybe you care about wildlife, right? And we, we end up seeing things like lesser prairie chicken and sage grouse, huge economic impacts for, for ranching throughout the West. Well, Again, these are critters that evolved in these treeless landscape. It shouldn't really surprise us that they don't have a, a, a bright future when we end up fragmenting these landscapes through the trees. And it's phenomenal when you look at stuff like prairie chicken, little as one tree per acre, they completely abandon their range. Same is to be said true for sage grouse. So, so, so whether you're looking at kind of this invading you know, resource, whether you're looking at a, a range health, or whether you're looking at uh, endangered species, you end up having a divergence of interests come together to say, you know what, we all want to solve this problem. And, and, and the way we really went about it was trying to not, again, let's not create a program to solve it, or let's not even create a partnership, because there's already incredible partnerships throughout the West to solve this. We need something different. We need a campaign. And it's a campaign that's centered around delivering outcomes. In our case, we don't hate trees. We don't want to just kill trees. What we want to do, we want to restore western grazing lands. And so again, looking at those diverse users, the very first primary partner we went to is the western ranching community. And really, you know, made them, it, it, without them and without their, not, not only their buy-in and support, but unwavering buy-in and support and energy to make it happen, it wasn't going to happen. And then, you know, go, go, go down the list. You, you start looking at the endangered species implications. So Fish and Wildlife Service was a natural partner. And we went to them, not only did we say, we want to proactively link up and do good things, we want to streamline the way that the regulations are in place that, that allow us to actually implement conifer removal to restore these range at scale. So we entered into this incredible agreement where the ranchers that participate with us through this Work and Lands for Wildlife banner, they're given an insurance policy that says if the birds are ultimately listed, those landowners are good to go because they've already met their, their requirements under ESA. Um, the, 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 the songbird community, you know, people with Audubon, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, all of those groups, you know, we end up creating a mechanism where they could help fuel some of the restoration, help us put boots on the ground in our field office, to develop custom plans and so forth. Um, and, 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 and lastly, we went to the sportsmen. 
And the sportsman community is, is a huge partner in all of this, and they also see the same impacts associated with tree removal on, on, on critters that, that, that they really care about. And so um, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Mule Deer Foundation, Pheasants Forever, all of these, you know, groups pooled resources in significant ways to partner together to, 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 to enter into this campaign. And the last thing that we had to have now, we've got this coalition, we have this campaign, we needed a strategic game plan. How are we going to break up millions of acres and do enough of the right things in the right places? And that's really where we look to science. We created these incredible partnerships with the University of Montana, with, with Google Earth and Engine, and with, with, a, with a number of you to really create some incredible innovative technological tools. You'll see more in, in the next panel. But, but really equipped us with not only the right places to work, but we also looked at the phenology of the, of the, of the plant. And we looked at you know, from early succession down to co-dominance, down to a forest, um, we could really generate a lot more results if we focused where we had just a couple of trees out there and you still had the, 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 the shrubs and the grasses. And if we focused on those phase one and two, those early ones, we could restore, you know, millions of acres and not have to deal with in invasive species like cheatgrass and so forth. And, and so, so turning all that stuff loose, um, we ended up with uh, a massive campaign. We linked it with the Farm Bill, and we went to work. And I will tell you today, we have now taken landscapes like these shown in the top picture and completely restored them on the ground today to the tune of over 600,000 acres of actual trees, which impacts millions of acres, just through Work of Lands for Wildlife Partnership. Broadly, We've worked with 2,154 ranchers across the West in only seven years and in, 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 in looking at their entire operation have conserved seven and a half million acres. So I would also submit to you as we go forth today, we've learned a lot here. We've, we've, we've obviously uh, done a lot of great things, but we're also now needing to now take this and really scale it up and really expand it. So, so with that, I, I thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Slides aren't up yet. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, John. And it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you all today. Um, <clears throat> my name is Dustin Miller. I'm the administrator for the Idaho Governor's Office of Species Conservation. And uh, today I'd like to talk about a concept known as outcome-based land management, something that we've been talking about here at this conference and other conferences. But this is something that's pretty important to us in Idaho. We really want to try to focus on outcomes. Uh, on the, on primarily, right now, we're really focused on our, our sage step landscape, rather than just prescriptive uh, uh, prescriptions, uh, primarily for, for livestock grazing. Livestock grazing is the most ubiquitous use of BLM rangelands uh, in Idaho. Um, so again, this is an important uh, discussion for us, important topic for us in Idaho. And some of this information was put together uh, with the help of our University of Idaho Rangeland Center. So I appreciate uh, the help of Dr. Karen Launchbaugh. Um, a little bit about who we are and what we do. I'm gonna skip that in the essence of time. Uh, so outcome-based management, uh, you know, in, in a, a simple definition, is a management strategy that focuses on achieving outcomes framed across landscapes that include ecological, economic, and social goals. Outcome-based land management approaches are aimed at maintaining viable, and sustainable working landscapes that provide diverse goods and services. Um, so why is, this, uh, why is this management strategy so important? Well, as we all know, the West was founded upon the use of our abundant natural resources and activities, such as livestock grazing, timber harvest, mining, and those were the dominant land use activities uh, for, for quite some time, uh, and also the drivers of local economies. But today's West is, is a different place, uh, as people tend to value natural resources, uh, and landscapes and, and access to those landscapes uh, more broadly than they used to, be that for healthy range and conditions for both livestock and wildlife, recreation, renewable energy resources, and quiet open spaces. Western landscapes, as we know, are dynamic. Um, you know, uh, areas like the Great Basin, we are seeing an un unprecedented changes, uh, such as increased fire frequency, 
cheatgrass and other exotic invasive uh, plant invasions. Um, some habitat fragmentation is also occurring in the, in the Great Basin, not to the extent as it may be in more of our energy producing states to the east, uh, but still that is, that is an issue for us. Um, ecological process, we, we know this, ecological processes uh, on this landscape occur without deference to land ownership. They don't start and stop at, uh, at property boundaries. Uh, natural resources are still the economic drivers of rural communities, and activities such as grazing most often relies on a pattern of mixed ownership for economic viability. Um, but healthy rangelands and viable grazing operations are not mutually exclusive. They can coexist together. <coughs> so some of the advantages of this outcome-based approach. Um, there's a uniqueness to the West that people have come to love. Big open spaces, as I said earlier. And it's these big open spaces that provide for a whole host of multiple uses. Um, the outcome-based approach is inherently collaborative. Uh, the way we, that way we can engage a broader spectrum of partners in land management approaches. Um, every, everybody here has, has been talking a lot about collaboration. That's really how we're going to get some of these things done on the landscape. Uh, outcome-based management occurs at scales that matter. Um, that could mean focusing actions and decisions at the scale of ranches and allotments. Uh, as this is the level where management decisions are often made. Uh, or it could be an entire watershed. You know, there's, there's, uh, it, it, it varies based on, um, y you know, the issue, the resources, and the, and the people involved. Everybody, everybody kind of has their own definition of what, uh, what the landscape, how you really define what landscape really means. Um, I believe that outcome-based management can be a, a tool to also increase the economic viability of livestock operations while maintaining and improving rangeland conditions. Um, this is part of that maintaining open spaces idea that's, that's vitally important to a lot of us in the West. Um, with outcome-based management, we, we try to uh, base decisions on the ecology and the socioeconomics of rangeland management, and like I said earlier, be less prescriptive and, uh, and more flexible. Um, the Bureau of Land Management recently, as of, I believe, last fall, just um, announced an initiative to focus more on this outcome-based approach on BLM lands, focusing more on uh, the ecological outcomes than, again, being, uh, th than being more prescriptive, uh, as, as typically uh, the agencies are. I know the BLM is looking at six to 12 pilot projects in the West, and we hope, I'll, I'll talk a little bit here in, uh, in, in a bit about the Rock Creek Ranch, and we're hoping that this, we will, we will be able to, uh, to do one of those pilot projects for the BLM. Um, and then locally based solutions and defensible actions. I mean, decisions are, are best made at the local level. Um, and it's important that, uh, that we maintain the collaborative framework that's gonna help us succeed when there are challenges. Um, <coughs> impediments to the outcome-based approach. Historic lack of flexibility on federal lands due to traditional policy-driven management, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, on-off dates, uh, little flexibility to adjust grazing uh, based on precipitation, year-to-year -year variation, um, those types of things have been challenges in the past. Um, there's also concern by private landowners uh, that outsiders, uh, about outsiders making decisions on their private lands. I mean, this is a huge concern, and it's vitally important that we have private landowners. If we're looking at a whole landscape uh, <coughs> approach here, that includes federal, state, and private, that we have private landowners at that local level driving these discussions. Uh, Greater sage grouse, for example, in Idaho, about 20% 20, 20 of the habitat for this species is on private lands. Um, so that's vitally important, especially those, those wet meadows and riparian areas that are, are so important during those uh, summer brood rearing months. See, I can't get through a presentation without mentioning sage grouse, right? Because that's kind of the story of my life. Um, you know, uh, culture, traditions, um, those are difficult to, ch to, to change. And there's uncertainty when deviating from more of those prescriptive uses. And then finally, and probably the most important thing here is trust. Uh, developing that trust. Uh, understanding where uh, each other are coming from. Um, that's how you're going to succeed, at foundation of trust. Uh, so Rock Creek Ranch uh, here in central Idaho, um, this, uh, we w we're kind of using this as a case study. We're talking about potential pilot projects, and again, on the BLM side, we're, we're, we're hopeful that BLM will sec select Rock Creek Ranch um, for one of their BLM pilot projects for outcome-based uh, grazing management. Uh, ranches in central Idaho. It's currently owned by the Nature Conservancy and the Wood River Land Trust. 
and is managed as a working cattle operation. Uh, the University of Idaho joined the, the landowners as the research arm uh, for, this, uh, for this endeavor, and it really serves as, as an experimental ranch for the University of Idaho. Uh, we haven't had, at, at the University of Idaho, uh, th there hasn't been this range component. Um, they had, have the Nancy Cummins Ranch up at, uh, in Salmon, Idaho. Um, that's all focused on, on production agriculture, um, uh, cattle production, but really in a private lands context. Um, this gives the University of Idaho that range component to do uh, a lot of research. Um, there's a diversity of wildlife species found on the ranch, uh, including sage grouse, elk, pronghorn, mule deer, other species. It's a 10,000 acre, uh, 10,000 acres of private land, 11,000 acres of BLM and four allotments, about 570 acres, and it's really in close, it's in close proximity to the Sun Valley area. Um, <coughs> Well, that map doesn't really give you a good idea, but um, it's really in the, it's the backdoor playground for a lot of folks that recreate uh, in that Sun Valley area. And that really is a recreation-based economy. Um, so there's all sorts of uses on these, on these federal lands that are part of the ranch. Um, so again, this is something that our, our Rock Creek Advisory Committee is, is looking into, trying to develop projects that are really focused on outcomes, uh, targeted forage utilization, fire risk management, invasive species management, and wildlife habitat objectives, to name a few, are some things that we're really trying to focus on uh, to demonstrate um, really the, va the validity and the efficacy of this outcome-based approach. Um, and so we've got a diverse group of stakeholders that are really focused on this. Uh, partnerships and collaboration is key. I mean, sounds cliche. We've been, you know, really beating this drum for a long time, but it's true. This needs to be the foundation. And uh, with this outcome-based grazing approach, like I said, the University of Range, uh, the University of Idaho Rangeland Center, go Vandals! It's the University of Idaho, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, is helping lead the charge uh, on this. Multiple partners at the federal, state level. And speaking of partnerships, again, special thanks to Dr. Karen Launchbaugh with the. U of I Rangeland Center, and for uh, Lou Lunty of the Nature Conservancy in Idaho for help with the content here. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody had enough coffee to be awake yet? Um, let me start by thanking the Western Governors Association for the chance to be here. Um, I'll introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Tyson Bertoni Riggs. I work with the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. Not everyone might be familiar with our work, so I thought I'd take just a second for shameless self-promotion, tell you a little bit about us. So we're uh, a group that works on healthy landscapes and vibrant rural communities. The way that we do this is by networking with community-based organizations that work at a field level and really trying to elevate some of the policy barriers that they see to a national level and also elevate some of the innovations that they come across in doing this sort of all lands and landscape scale conservation work and export that, uh, develop learning tools and export that to other groups on the ground that are interested in trying those approaches. Uh, we also have a storytelling component. <coughs> so the benefit of going on day two is that I've already heard a lot of people say some of the things that I think are important to, to hear in an event like this. So what I'd like to do is really kind of uh, sum up some of those things. Uh, they match very nicely with a recent report that RVCC worked on on all lands uh, collaboration and looking at some of the barriers to that. And I think uh, what I heard yesterday was a, a lot of the same things. Uh, and I think that we have some solutions and some immediate term uh, opportunities for both big P and little p policy uh, that we can, we can work on to really try to further some of this. I should say as well that most of my background is in uh, forest restoration. So if it feels a little bit different from ESA and rangeland, uh, you know, it's, it, it is a different set of problems and it feels a little less uh, project specific and maybe a little more agency wide. So the three things that I kept hearing yesterday and the three things that came up in our report were really collaboration, time, and money. So those are the three opportunities but also the three big challenges to a lot of this work. So starting with collaboration, you know, it's, uh, so John started us off yesterday by identifying collaboration as sort of the theme of natural resource management at the moment. And I think that's very true, but in forest management in particular, collaboration has often been limited to the planning side of things. I think we're moving into an era where we really have to be focused on implementation, and there's a collaborative approach to that work as well. Uh, and I would say that as we work on all lands in particular, this is going to take collaboration between agencies, between federal and state agencies, and also between agencies and private landowners. <clears throat> so ways that we can do that and opportunities that are before us now, and groups like RBCC, and we're not the only one in this space, but 
groups that can uh, look at some of the innovations that have happened, look at some of the best practices for communication between those agencies and share that with other groups, uh, that'll be a really key way to, to accomplish some of these partnerships. The other opportunity here, and this is pitched largely to those of you who work in, in state offices, is good neighbor authority. Uh, a lot's been said about it. Uh, there's a lot of promise there. Uh, there's the timber component, as Idaho has demonstrated. But I'd also point out that as Idaho has shown, or I'm sorry, as Oregon has shown, uh, there's an opportunity there to create cost share positions between state and federal agencies that can help bridge some of these gaps. So these folks can be knowledge brokers that are really working in multiple ways. Uh, maybe that's between uh, state fish and wildlife department and a federal agency, but getting people that see the tools and authorities and funding sources between those different agencies is really important for this kind of work uh, because it does seem to be stitching it together that, that really is the, the hard part. So time, the second point here, time. What we saw in the report over and over again is that most practitioners on the ground, all lands work is never their primary focus. So they really have to carve out time in order to make these projects happen, right? It takes working in a new way uh, and an absent new personnel that really have this as a, a core component of their mission, you really do have to find a way to make more time. But I think that we do have a really great opportunity right now, at least with the Forest Service, with the EADM efforts. So that's the uh, environmental analysis and decision making. Uh, whatever your politics, whatever your view of the best way to move forward on that, whether it's CEs or as RVCC has advocated for more efficiencies within the agency and the process that they use currently, the idea is that this will free up more staff time. I think the one thing that we can say that we can expect to see out of that is the opportunity to engage in more partnerships. Uh, so I would say, you know, be engaged in that process if you're not already. The Forest Service has been incredibly open. Uh, and they've convened a series of roundtable discussions by region. Uh, so if, if you have not missed yours yet, definitely get engaged there. And the third component is money, right? It takes funding to do all this. And it, it may seem like a simple thing and it may seem like something that everyone in this room has already thought of and identified, but just to say it out loud, we have a Congress that's working to pass the fiscal year 2018 budget by the end of this month, less than, and then we'll immediately begin working on the fiscal year 19 budget. So this is a key time to be engaged in those conversations. We have a farm bill that's up for reauthorization. So all of these private land conservation programs that we're working with now require somebody to step up and say that it's worked and really defend those programs. We also have other projects that are out there that already exist, like the Collaborative Landscape Forest Restoration Program, that again, require reauthorization and require funding. So now is a time to make your voice heard on those things. And then finally, in case everyone isn't sick of already hearing it, fire funding fix, right? How can we do this work if we continue to erode the baseline budgets to accomplish it? So if you're not engaged in any of those topics, definitely do so. Uh, you know, the other opportunity that we have here, again, particularly with forest issues, <clears throat> is the Forest Service has begun a process of uh, forest products modernization. We're not quite sure what this will look like just yet, uh, but they acknowledge that they have a system that's about 30 years old, uh, and to their credit, they are moving forward on making that more modern. There's a lot of opportunities there, but one that I'll highlight is that Currently, we have a system where planning and implementation are largely divorced from each other, and it's hard to track from one to the other. And I think that we can encourage the Forest Service to develop spatially explicit tools to allow for greater strategic prioritization across the landscape, not just of planning efforts, but also of implementation efforts. And I think that part of that is demonstrating to partners that we are doing what we say we're doing, and to be able to communicate that is an incredibly powerful tool to show that we are moving towards landscape scale restoration. So with that, I look forward to questions, and thanks again. Good morning, uh, and thank you to Western Governors Association for the opportunity to join you all here today, and to Dustin for the shout out to PNC and my alma mater, Go Vandals. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, in, uh, again, my name is Brent Keith. I'm with the Nature Conservancy, and I am housed in our Washington, D.C. office, actually just across the river in Virginia. Um, not that most people make a distinction between the two. Um, but I am a Westerner. I grew up in eastern Oregon, and so the West is a very important place to me. Um, and so I really appreciate this opportunity to come and join you all and talk about some of the issues impacting the West. In my time living away from the West, I've taken up reading some of the great Western authors, and so if you'll indulge me, I'd like to sort of bookend some of my comments today with a couple of comments from a few of my favorites. Um, seemingly anticipating today's forum, Wallace Stegner in Sound of Mountain Water wrote that one cannot be pessimistic about the West. This is the native home of hope. When it fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the quality that most characterizes and preserves it, 
then it will have achieved itself and outlived its origins. Then it has a chance to create a society to match its scenery. I think it's safe to say that at the conservancy, we largely agree with Stegner here, that we can accomplish a heck of a lot more when we come together to try and solve these tricky solutions or there are these tricky problems with innovative solutions instead of finding new things to fight over. After all, there's no shortage of folks spoiling for a good fight these days. Um, our mission at the Conservancy is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends, and this mission inherently recognizes that people and nature are inextricably intertwined, and that choosing one over the other is a false choice, that all life actually depends on healthy, naturally functioning ecosystems. As we've discussed, there's an urgency to do better in addressing the challenges that we all face, and to do it at a meaningful scale. I don't have an answer to what exactly that scale is. In my book, it's a scale large enough to move the needle, but one that's not so large that we get unnecessarily bogged down in process. The many complex issues we face today demand that we find ways to make a bigger impact on these systems through strategies aimed at achieving system scale change. And by system, in the most basic sense, I'm referring to a group of interacting, interrelated, or interdependent parts that form a complex, unified whole that have a specific purpose. I have one takeaway from yesterday, and that is that we are working in some pretty wickedly complex systems across the West, and it's not gonna get any simpler. One key question that I don't know that we've addressed and I think is worth thinking about shortly is uh, whether we are working on or in the systems. By this I mean, are we seeking to make tweaks to the various processes that function and create the system, or sorry, are we looking to actually change the very structure of the system itself? So to put this in an analogy, are we looking to be better airline pilots or looking to be better aerospace engineers? I would posit that we probably need to do both and we probably need to do both at the same time. That adds additional complexity to our work. And one of the mechanisms the Conservancy thinks about in hoping to build better systems is our development by design work. At base, this work seeks to take a smart, science-based approach to infrastructure and resource development to enable companies, governments, and communities to make better decisions about where development could occur and where it shouldn't. Through the application of science and good planning methods, we can step back and take a holistic look at what development does to natural systems and the people and species that depend upon them to make better, more informed decisions about how to utilize resources and balance the impacts of development and conservation. Core to this work is demonstrating how to mitigate, that is to avoid, minimize, and compensate for impacts to natural resources. I would suggest that mitigation is critical to the success of large-scale conservation planning. It need not be overly complex, but in order to function, and support a growing conservation marketplace, we need some basic policy components. Those include clear mitigation policies at the federal level. These policies can support federal permitting, such as mitigated FONSIs, findings of no significant impact, and give regulated public and mitigation providers a roadmap for success. We need to have clear principles articulated in these policies, including transparency. They should be clearly articulated so that project proponents know what will be required of them when they come to the table. This will help support faster project reviews and, and also support a robust marketplace if mitigation providers know what they can provide in order to meet the needs that, that the project proponents have. And we need consistency. Good mitigation policies should ensure that similar impacts have similar mitigation obligations across resource types, no matter what field office you sit in. We need to provide uh, offsets that are proportional to impacts. This should be science-based, but it need not be overly complex. There's certainly a precision trap that we should try and avoid in, in trying to do the best we can with the limited information that we have. And we need to create finite obligations and allow for flexibility in choosing mitigation mechanisms. And once we have all this in place, of course, it's not self-implementing. We need to all invest in implementation and training. Uh, which will both be necessary ingredients for success. And much work has already been done in this space, including in California, the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, or DRECP, which looks across 10 million acres of BLM lands to determine the best places for renewable energy development while protecting the most important ecosystems across the region, all while providing enough room for California to meet its aggressive renewable energy goals. We need to work together to implement these innovative approaches and to demonstrate that we can do a better job when we come, to early, come together early to wrestle with these challenging problems. It isn't easy and admittedly often takes too long, eight years in the case of DRECP, but that's why we need to work harder to improve and demonstrate that it can deliver real benefits to both people and nature. We can do better planning to move away from the reactionary bring me a rock approach that is too often used to, de to describe the federal permitting process. In closing, I'd like to, to go to another prominent Western author, Willow Cather, who wrote in O Pioneers, we come and go, but the land is always here, and the people who love it and understand it are the ones who own it for a little while. As we think about the people who love and understand Western landscapes, and I count myself among those, I think it's important that we recognize that the West, like the rest of the country, is constantly changing. 
becoming more diverse, quickly growing, becoming more urbanized or suburbanized. And while those of us in this room certainly have our differences and our similarities in how we think about and value the West, it's also fair to say that there are many voices and many opinions about the West that are not represented in this room. And I think it's important that we seek to engage more diverse voices at, and around the table early in the process as we have these discussions about the future of the Western landscapes. As Noreen wisely noted yesterday, people support what they build together. And so I hope that we will take this challenge to do a better job of connecting and growing, to connecting with a growing and changing diverse population across the West. After all, we all have a stake in the health of the Western landscapes and uh, we all can do a better job. I think that's, that's certainly recognized. So with that, I'll close and look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, I'm Doug Wheeler, and uh, I'm a partner at a big international law firm in Washington. Uh, I've come here today because I've got a story to talk about uh, the West. And by way of sort of establishing bona fides, I need to tell you that I've been at this since the enactment of the Endangered Species Act in 1973. You can probably tell that I've had some experience. And I've made a subspecialty in my law practice of tracking uh, the Endangered Species Act and its implementation, uh, particularly, and I think with regard to today's topic of cross-boundary management of resources, particularly with regard to Section 10 and its provision for habitat conservation planning and the way in which that tool uh, has evolved. I'm here really in my capacity as a counsel to the Western Riverside Regional Conservation Authority, a California agency which is charged with administration of the Western Riverside MSHCP. I'll admit to being an advocate for that program and that agency, but my thinking about habitat conservation planning as a means by which to integrate uh, economic and environmental objectives goes back to time that I spent, believe it or not, at the Department of the Interior uh, many years ago and in California uh, as a resource official there. Uh, if I'd thought about it, I would have brought a map to show you a picture of Riverside uh, County, California in Southern California, part of the Inland Empire, 200 miles long, a population uh, greater than many states, uh, growing uh, pressures from urbanization because in that part of the county, the western part, uh, it is proximate to the Los Angeles Basin. It provides affordable housing, um, which is not otherwise available, and it has a very important natural heritage to protect and manage. Uh, in 1999, a group of county commissioners uh, decided that there had to be a better way to reconcile the differences between development pressure on one hand and the development which is sought in that community uh, and the protection of its natural resource base uh, in the other. They had turned to a habitat conservation planning, not without some trepidation, uh, not without uh, some experience that was not altogether positive in attempting a single species approach to protect the Stevens kangaroo rat and its habitat, very controversial at the time, enough to cause many of those uh, political leaders to think that maybe HCPs were not the way to go. But wiser heads prevailed, and in 2004, uh, thanks to a partnership that includes the Fish and Wildlife Service, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, the environmental community, and the development community, Western Riverside adopted a 1.2 million acre planning horizon in which cross-boundary management was the imperative. From that 1.2 million acre planning horizon, it was determined that 500,000 acres would ultimately be necessary to protect the broad suite of species and their habitat which exist in that part of the county. The plan today embraces 146 species, 33 of which are listed as threatened or endangered either under the federal law or California's own uh, Endangered Species Act. So coming together around the notion that across ownerships, across interests, diversity of interests indeed, conservation on one hand um, and development on the other, it would be possible to forecast the needs of infrastructure in that community for 75 years, which is the length of the permit uh, that the county holds and the constituent towns hold 
uh, from the Fish and Wildlife Service under Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act. So 2004, uh, this very ambitious plan was adopted with a view toward finally uh, establishing a, a working plan that would have a life that long, assuming that funding could be found, assuming that political leadership would persist, assuming that the partnership would remain intact. I can give you a very quick uh, update of where things stand as a result of that uh, commitment. Uh, together, uh, I should say that of the 500,000 acres to be protected for benefit of those 146 species, 350,000 was in public ownership, um, mainly the San Bernardino National Forest, and that complements the work that was being done to acquire private land. So 150,000 acres of private land to be acquired according to the prescriptions offered for those species by the resource agencies. About a uh, 55 or 60,000 acres have been acquired thus far uh, at a cost of nearly $460 million. That's a combination of uh, resources, county, state, federal, private, because the development community, in recognition that this plan provides advanced mitigation for impacts, have contributed as well. And on the other side of the equation, that's, that's the conservation side. It's an extraordinary story uh, that this land will be protected forever in a rapidly growing part of Southern California. On the other side of the equation, diverse interests, cross-boundary collaboration, uh, it has been proved that this plan has facilitated the development of infrastructure, as its proponents argued, in ways that no one could have perceived. The 75-year plan for infrastructure, mostly transportation development, is well underway in its implementation. There has not been a single lawsuit relevant to environmental impacts of that in infrastructure, and there has been an expenditure for infrastructure of about $6 billion, either current or planned, 25 projects now underway in this rapidly growing community. Perhaps the biggest bottom line of that experience is that the infrastructure is being built more quickly, more efficiently, and without litigation than if there had been no MSHCP. And in fact, uh, some calculations recently reflect that the savings in the construction of that infrastructure to date uh, equivalent to $450, $460 million, essentially the cost of the plan to date. So the plan is paying for itself, which is not something that most people had anticipated. It's not without its problems. You, you need to sustain the partnership uh, that has made this possible over a very long period of time in changing political climates. I should have said this is an extremely, relatively conservative jurisdiction in Southern California, and you would not expect its county commission to be so supportive of the, as they are of the plan for conservation purposes. Make no mistake, they're motivated not by conservation necessarily, but by the recognition that conservation must be in place if infrastructure is to be developed. And the lesson I take from that, not only that this is an effective way to achieve integration of those economic and environmental objectives, but as we think about a national infrastructure plan going forward, it would be a, a huge mistake not to provide in that plan for mitigation, advanced mitigation of its impacts through reliance on HCPs and devices like that. Happy to answer your questions as we progress through the conversation. So there was lots of good stuff in there. Um, something just came to my mind, and I don't, I don't really know how much people can comment on it, but Doug just said something and, uh, about that there wasn't litigation, and that really hasn't come up a lot in the last day. We had an example in Idaho with the Payette Forest Coalition where essentially somebody brought a lawsuit about what, what they and the Forest Service were working out. And essentially the judge said to the person who brought the lawsuit, no, what these people worked out seems to be adequate from all sorts of uh, 
you know, legal ways. They covered everything. They participated. You didn't. Um, we're moving ahead. So with that said, do you guys, can you guys think of other examples where, where this sort of collaborative process is, is reducing the number of lawsuits and sort of changing the political environment, albeit kind of slowly because of some of these successes? Anybody want to offer that? Their own, Dustin, you got something, you think? Yeah, I, well, you know, one prominent one in Idaho, um, aside from the Pay It Coalition example that uh, John just mentioned, is the, uh, the Idaho road list rule, <clears throat> which um, it was under uh, Governor Kempthorne at the time where uh, the states had an opportunity to, to petition the Secretary of, of Agriculture uh, to draft their own rule to manage roadless areas within your particular states. In Idaho, we've got 9.3 million acres of inventoried roadless areas. <clears throat> it was the 2001 Clinton rule that we were, uh, that we were under and we were dealing with some pretty top-down uh, management that, um, quite frankly, a state like Idaho doesn't really appreciate sometimes, as you all well know. Uh, so under, under Governor Kempthorne at the, t at the time, we, we did petition, um, he petitioned the Secretary of Agriculture to develop our own roadless rule. Uh, we set up a collaborative, and in fact, the, the first uh, administrator for the Office of Species Conservation was a guy by the name of Jim Caswell, and that probably rings a bell with a lot of folks. Uh, major experience with the, with the Forest Service. Uh, after his time at OSC, he went on to come, went on to uh, run the, the Bureau of Land Management in D.C., but when he was at OSC, he was tapped by the governor to put together a rule. Um, it was a collaborative effort. We had county commissioners, industry folks, timber industry, uh, and we had conservation organizations at the table. We developed this rule. Um, it was different in, in a lot of ways from the Clinton rule. It gave us some more flexibility. Uh, we had a zonal approach but it still allowed for protection of roughly the same amount of acres, uh, 9.3 million acres. So that was challenged by other groups uh, in uh, district court. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was upheld. Uh, it even, the, the Idaho rolled this rule in our collaborative even withstood a, a legal, uh, a, an appeal in the Ninth Circuit. Um, so it really, uh, to answer the question, um, yes, I feel that a lot of these uh, collaborative projects and collaborative efforts are helping uh, overcome some of these legal challenges. Building things together, um, you know, again, people support what they build together. I really appreciated what Noreen said uh, and, and what Brent uh, expanded upon um, because that's really how we're going to get some good things done. So that's one example in Idaho. Other folks? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I think it's, it's certainly true that collaboration uh, can lead to a reduced litigation environment. I would say yes and, right? So uh, in Oregon, I can think of uh, probably my favorite success story is the Malheur National Forest. Uh, two collaboratives, Blue Mountain Forest Partners and Harney County Restoration Collaborative, uh, worked to uh, really iron out disagreements. It was a forest where essentially all uh, timber harvest had been shut down for years, and after years and years of, of hard work and collaboration, they really did come to a place where it's been a litigation-free forest for, uh, I won't guess how many years, but quite a few years running now. But it's a yes and. So it was that and the ability to bring in uh, specific funding sources and implementation tools like CLFRP that allowed that forest to move forward. And, and I say that in part because I think a lot of weight is being put on collaboration and the social component of collaboration. But in order to move forward and really have successes, we also have to be focused on the implementation side of things. I would offer, the, the, so maybe not directly on litigation, but one of the things that the Conservancy is really interested in is how do we bring people together earlier in the process and sort of make some of these decisions about where certain uses are appropriate. Um, and I think both avoiding litigation, but then also leading to faster permitting times at those places where everyone agrees these are low conflict zones, this makes sense whether it's renewable energy or conventional energy or grazing, whatever, what have you. Um, we've definitely seen that there are a lot of examples, I think, around the West, certainly in Southern Nevada and inter solar energy zones and, and other places where we've seen those permitting times coming down. And at least to my knowledge, I don't think we've seen litigation yet. Okay, another thing that, that came up here a little bit that we haven't discussed too much is this question question of sustaining these things, either through money, time, energy, and so forth, they get started, and for some people, they're, you know, it's their job to sustain it, their staff, they're paid, 
but for other people, they have livelihoods they're trying to deal with as they work in these collaborative processes. Do you guys have any thoughts and advice on, and I know Bob and the Idaho Forest Restoration folks, we talk about this a lot because a lot of these people essentially are volunteers that do a lot of this and they do have other things to do. How do we sustain these things? Could I just respond to that? Uh, you all can. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I think leadership is the critical element. The, the, whether it's paid or volunteer, and both are necessary, uh, there has to be a strong and continuing commitment to the success of the program. In the time that I spent in uh, California working even at the local level, uh, those programs, those plans, those processes which succeeded were those in which there was a joint commitment and a persistent commitment to success, a, a recognition that it takes time, it takes effort, and that over time the benefits will be shown. But it's not simply from the rule book that one derives those successes, it's through the collaboration of committed individuals. And political leadership, in, I, I mentioned that Riverside is a conservative county, it is more conservative today than it was when the plan was adopted in 2004, yet there is a strong and continuing conservative mandate for the continuation of a program that is now uh, 10 years old. Kim? So in March of 2010, Fish and Wildlife Service came out and uh, made the determination on sage grouse that they were biologically warranted for listing. And obviously that sent a shock wave throughout the entire West, especially on the ranching side of the equation as far as the uncertainty and what that meant. The very next day, another division of of the federal government, Department of Ag, said, you know what, we want to help you. And again, it, we're, we're from, from the same government that potentially, you know, is, is holding the, a threat, but, but here's this, uh, again, here's an opportunity. And, and there was a lot of, again, maybe the initial motivation for doing the right thing as far as restoring those rangelands might have come from that initial spark or that, that shockwave. But, but I go back to Jim's comments yesterday as far as, but, but that was probably this much of the entire motivation. And now that thing has evolved into this campaign to actually restore the grazing lands and proactively solve these problems. And so now, you know, as you start going 2011, 12, 13, every one of us, you know, whether we're working with the states or NGOs or federal governments or, or the ranching community, all did everything we possibly could to move the needle and, and demonstrate our ability to work together and solve the problem. And then you got to this weird date of September, 2015, where a decision is ultimately going to be made. And, and, and in that case, because of all of the work of everybody, you know, pulling together, we got a decision that sage routes were no longer warranted for listing. Um, and so now that threat, right, has largely been removed. And so to answer your question as far as sustainment goes, I would ask, well, well what did you do through that campaign, like through Work on Lands for Wildlife, since 2015? And how did that compare to what you did before? Because if our true motivation was to simply avoid an ESA listing, we would have took all that money, put it in briefcases, went somewhere else and did work. But that's not what happened at all. In fact, we actually just did an evaluation and looked at, on average, from 2010 to 2015, or 2014, we did about 600,000 acres of conservation with, with these folks every single year. Since then, we've maintained the momentum and actually increased those numbers a little bit uh, into you know, 15, 16, 17. Now we're getting four years out. So, so again, I think when, when the, the goal is to conserve working landscapes, and that goal includes people, it includes wildlife, it includes landscapes, rural communities, and everybody's bought into that same outcome, I think the opportunities to sustain it is, is very large. Okay, another question is, um, there appears to be a lack of sort of an integrated methodology for communication and land planning across and policy across federal agencies. Um, do we need to think about longer term solutions to institutionalize a more integrated federal planning process across agencies? I mean, we have four agencies that seem to do the same thing in many cases, but they have very different cultures, very different styles of communication, so forth and so on. Is that part of the issue? Yes. There's a yes. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, 
little known that the Endangered Species Act, when it was enacted in 1973, includes a provision to encourage and enhance ecosystem management. There has been no use of that authority by any agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service included, uh, except for or despite its continued focus on individual species uh, and individual habitats. That's changing. We're talking now about multiple species plans, as I indicated. But the communication within agencies and across agencies simply does not exist. And although it's difficult to say, uh, we need nothing more than a better means by which to aggregate that experience, uh, those commitments of the agencies, and to bring those to bear in situations where a coordinated federal effort would be hugely beneficial uh, to states and to local governments. One of the things that has helped, I think, in Western Riverside, and during my experience in Sacramento as well, the realization that a single agency, either a federal agency or a state agency, cannot be as effective in dealing with a shared resource as if they were collaborating to achieve an outcome. And yet, as obvious as that is, and as reasonable as it seems, and cost effective too, it is not happening. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with all of that. And I think that in the short term, there are some things that we can do structurally to probably move closer to that. And it, it may be simple things. So I think cost share positions is one way to do that. Uh, breaking people out of their particular agency silo and having them work between agencies. Another is co-location. Uh, you know, I think we've been practicing collaboration with the public for a while. Uh, but it really does take a different kind of collaboration between agency to agency. Uh, and so getting people in the same room, having those conversations early and often uh, is really important. I'd say that in my experience as well, we can use the venue of collaboratives, public collaboratives, to start to have those conversations. So if you have agency participation, state and federal agency, uh, that can be a place where those conversations start to be had and you get to see those shared priorities of a community and you can start to, to get to know one another as agency employees and move those, those projects forward. John, the states can be the drivers of this. Um, the, the experiences that we have heard about this morning and we know about are all state-driven or state-initiated. I'm thinking of the WAP we'll work on, uh, the lesser prairie chicken, for instance, the sage grouse. All of those compel the federal government to bring resources to the table in a coordinated way, which might not occur if those plans originated in Washington, would not occur if those plans originated in Washington. I, I guess maybe to add one more thing on this, I couldn't agree with, with these comments more wholeheartedly, is, is the fact that if, if you think through, just again on the sage grouse example, you have something that was really unique here in that like Western Governors Association, WGA, was really one of the key cogs to provide a forum. That, that really did allow individual states, federal land manager, you know, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Forest Service, and, and NRCS and, and the like, to really sit down at a regional level, you know, with our partners and develop a, a range-wide plan that, that, that really basically just said, here are, from a 50,000 foot view, here's the big landscapes we all collectively agree to conserve, here's the primary threats we agree, you know, to work on, but then left all the flexibility to the locals in those communities to figure out how are you going to meet this you know how are you going to work within your own you know restrictions and needs uh, to make this happen and I think that was really really important from our agency's perspective because quite frankly without that we, we end up getting tunnel vision within a portion of the range that we're working in and that's all that's important because that's all we know about and we don't have this range-wide context either to communicate and so if we're working in in Montana buying conservation easements with ranches up in the high line to prevent subdivision from happening happening as an example, it, 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 it's hard to tell why we're so focused on that if we don't step back and put it in the national context of here's how we are part of the broader solution and then put our piece into it. And so without that forum of, of meaningful communication and partnerships, but, but not real prescriptive down to that local level, give us all the decision space collectively, I, I think it's allowed us all to be much more successful. You know, I, I wonder a little bit if the Department of Interior does indeed move forward with its reorganization plans, and I know that's all in flux, sounds like they need to think about this as an opportunity to do this restructuring of communication and, and uh, planning to deal with this, whether they will or not, I don't know. And of course, the Forest Service isn't part of this, yet that's 
also going to have an effect on wherever that goes in terms of interagency collaboration and so forth, I think. Do you folks now have questions for our panel? There's lots of experience up here at the, with real projects, so I wanted to have an, uh, a chance to do that. We got a hand here. There's the mic, uh, Zach. So. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff Morissette with the National Invasive Species Council. Related to what John was just talking about with this possible reorg, and we'll see how that unfolds. And maybe a question to Doug. So with our concern, uh, coordinating across 13 federal agencies about invasive species, I'm curious about the ESA implications and authorization as a tool, t as we're finding invasive species are probably the number one threat to endangered or threatened species across the U.S., and we're working on analysis to show that. Are there, are there, is there leverage within the, the uh, Endangered Species Act that agencies or states or others could use to help fight invasives? Well, as you, as you know, there is no explicit mandate uh, to deal with that issue, but in the designation of critical habitat, that has to be a, a consideration. Uh, on the subject of uh, ESA modernization, in which uh, WGA has taken a, an important leadership role as a result of this series of conversations, there are opportunities, I think, to bring important lessons learned into that act. It's, it's tough to do. Um, the polarization in Washington prevents that kind of collaborative discussion of the ways in which that law should be, could be changed. But we've learned an awful lot since 1973 on how to manage habitat and species, how to move toward collaboration and multiple species and ecosystem management. That has to be reflected uh, in the law going forward. And those are the kinds of common sense proposals, including dealing with invasives, that should gain some traction. I said should gain some traction on Capitol Hill. We'll see. Anybody else want to address that at all? Well, I would say that certainly, um, like within the Great Basin cheatgrass, and you know, <clears throat> with the sage grouse planning efforts, um, with our focus on really ameliorating those those <coughs> threats, we had this as Kim discussed this threat of an ESA um, big regulatory hammer dropping on us with the listing. Um, we knew what had to be addressed. So, yeah, the ESA doesn't explicit, explicitly say you know go after invasive species, but it's really implied that knowing what we know about the spread of invasives throughout the West, throughout the country, and, you know, in the Great Basin where, I, where we're doing a lot of work, um, you know, that's, that's got to be our central focus in trying to recover or prevent uh, ESA listing. So it's really been an all-hands-on-deck approach in Idaho. We had that regulatory hammer hanging over our heads. We got our plans together. We worked collaboratively across the landscape with all of our partners, Fish and Wildlife Service made the right decision um, to not list uh, greater sage grouse. But again, as Tim alluded to, these actions are still moving forward. People are still going full bore ahead with these actions on the ground because it's, these are necessary things that we have to do to, to address this massive range-wide threat. Um, we're keeping up the intensity on invasive species. Um, it was largely the, the, the threat of a listing, I think, that served as a catalyst to, to get things moving there, but we've learned a whole hell of a lot about this landscape over the years and really what it's going to take to try to uh, ameliorate those threats. So um, the ESA did really kind of serve as a catalyst to really focus on really what, what really matters, again, in my portion of the world, the Great Basin uh, in, invasion species. I did see, and I'm, there's probably people in the room like Doug much more knowledgeable than me, but there was a story this morning that the federal government agreed to rewrite its critical habitat regs that they came out with two years ago. It settled the lawsuit that 20 states and others had brought against fish and wildlife, I think due to a critter in Alabama. It just hit the wire today that they agreed to rewrite those. I don't know how that's going to affect anything, but it's brand new news that you guys might want to track down because you, some of you obviously deal with that in some capacity. 
Any other questions at all? Yes, sir, last question. Um, talking about collaboration, one of the inhibitors is, is the current structure, and given that the federal agencies um, aren't getting more funding anytime soon, and that a lot of those responsibilities are shared with states. Too often states are treated merely as commenters in a process. And governors in the West have been advocating for a realigning and a new kind of a partnership with the federal government where we, we share in the decision making at the front end of a process. So instead of developing a rule, showing it to states and treating them like other commenters, actually start at the front end and, and let the states and, and local governments participate in designing a rule based on local knowledge, state knowledge, on how that will work in the terrain in each of our states. So for example, with sage grouse, Idaho is much different than our state in Colorado. And, and the threats were different. And so Idaho's plan was always going to look different than Colorado's, for example. And the kind of work that you need to do from a collaborative conservation standpoint was going to be different also. And so I really think, given the shortage of resources, that going forward, we need to realign this relationship between states and, and the federal government and not just give us accelerated ability to comment, but actually give us a seat at the table in a designing phase of these things where we can bring these collaborations that we have in our states to bear and help the federal agencies manage the land. And in Colorado, for example, our, our biologists, you know, give a lot of information and work very well with the BLM. And in most cases, whether you're talking about oil and gas or, or anything else, they're really the key people to decide it should go here, it shouldn't go here. And, but formalizing that in some way, I think, would move us forward. If any of you want to comment on that. Maybe I'll take a shot at that suggestion. Well, well I, I agree, couldn't agree more. I, I tried to make uh, the point during my remarks that the state's initiative uh, in many of the areas we've been discussing has been recognized, and one way to get the attention of the federal agencies is to take the initiative. That said, Section 6 provides much greater authority for states' initiatives than has been utilized by the federal government or by the states. And if there's one among several of those imperatives for reform of the Endangered Species Act, it's to expand upon the use of Section 6 in order to give the states a greater role in administration of the ESA. Out of time, but real quick, Doug, because that was such a good comment. Do you think the agencies can use six as is to expand that? And in other words, do they have the discretionary authority to do more, even if, God forbid, Congress doesn't do anything about it? I, I think they can. Okay. We, we lose sight of the fact that much of what is being done um, advantageously under the ESA today is not there in the statute. Uh, much of it has been administrative and regulatory, so there's more flexibility than is being utilized. Well, then join me in thanking our panel and the next.